Thank you. Okay, almost there. Now what we're going to do is we're going to move to the lightning round. So if I can ask the lightning round bees to come to the uh, come to here, I get me a couple of chairs as well, right? So uh, let me welcome everybody back up to the uh, up to the, uh, the podium. So you've met these folks before. Sarah Bonarano, who's a consultant advisor and um, past presidents at WebMD, Hope and Claire. Dr. Hasbro, Director of Illinois Department of Public Health, and Dr. Kami Spadi, Managing Director at Accenture's Health and Public Services Practice. So what I thought we'd do for 25 minutes in sort of bringing this to a close is what we thought of as the lightning round. So the idea is I'll ask, um, I'll ask our panelists to sort of weigh in on a few things, reflections from the day, et cetera, and then we'll sort of bring the day to a close. So my first question for the panelists, and let's go sort of left to right, right? It's not exactly crossfire, but we can, we can get close, is um, what was your big aha from today? Was there anything that just jumped out at you from today's discussion? Most of the conversations were actually not about the data, they were about access I said most of the, uh, the conversations today were not actually about the data, they were about accessing the data, methods to access the data. Um, well, for me, it was um, I have a lot of work to do at the uh, Department of Public Health. I mean, big data is by definition big, large, complex, hard to navigate. Um, talking about big data is big. You know, um, so I'm glad I stayed the whole day because I, I learned a lot. Um, but it, it occurs to me that we're going to have to be very strategic and very uh, purposeful uh, about the release of certain data sets um, so that they're uh, speaking to, to an issue, speaking to a purpose. Uh, just flooding the you know, open portals of data may not be the answer. Um, we're going to have to work, I think, internally to mine some of our big data ourselves, repackage this data. Um, and then uh, think um, very intelligently about how we're going to inform and educate consumers so that we can turn the tide from uh, interesting to, to important. So those are some of the things that I took away. Yeah, I, I took away uh, the, the focus on um, going from this big data concept where I, I, I had a preconceived notion that we were going to talk a lot about data. And I was really inspired by the human side um, that everybody was re is really struggling with and um, and really trying to drive forward a perspective on um, how this can be applied to actual um, citizens. Thank you. As, um, as we learned a little bit earlier, a good part of the audience uh, represents government policy makers. Some are here to learn. We've got folks from far away from California learning, uh, learning about health data. Um, we've got folks from the East Coast all across the country. And our hope is that they are going to take home with them certain lessons from today. Uh, what do you think is a key lesson or learning from today that you would hope people take with them back to their states or cities or counties or communities from today? That uh, privacy is not a deal breaker. It's really a statement about uh, uh, the issues of uh, trust and the issues of value. And you can ultimately solve for that if you can pass the privacy issue. I think we're going to have to use uh, pictures, infographics, um, and other presentations to really inform our uh, elected officials. Um, if they don't get it, we won't get the laws passed. And, and, and it occurs to me, as I said at the uh, Department of Public Health, there's a lot of very old, outdated, archaic um, laws on the books um, that restrict data from being liberated, even shared with academics and, and others. Um, we're in the process now of trying to identify those and, and streamline those 
but we're going to have to uh, translate this language to the lawmakers who are actually kind of the gatekeepers of uh, releasing the data. Um, and that's going to be very, very important. And, and also, you can't boil the ocean, right? There's a lot of information that everybody's talking about, and staying focused on certain tasks, having successes, building on those successes, I think is really great. Excellent. So, um, so very often when you look at a system, um, you know, at some point you really have to ask yourself honestly, these are great ideas. This is phenomenal. But why isn't it happening? Right? Why aren't we getting the progress we need to get? One of the, uh, and I'm going to ask a few questions around sort of, you know, maybe the elephants on the table. Um, but this is such a great idea. It's such a big thing. It's a breakthrough. Why is it so darn hard? And what exactly, what, what barriers do we have to break through to really open up the floodgates, presuming that this can have the impact to help the What's in, What is holding this back? I don't think people trust each other that information is going to be used um, primarily to help. I think there's a fear that at some point that information is going to be used uh, to hurt participants in some fashion. Yeah, I think it's going to, it's going to take a, a cultural uh, shift in terms of being comfortable with having your data out there somewhere in someone's cloud that, you know, that's, that's zipping around back and forth. Um, so that's going to be very, very important. And again, we have to get educated internally. I mean, as, as, um, as government officials, we really need to know the potential that can be unlocked from um, data. Um, at the end of the day, if we cannot change or move the lever in terms of changing health behavior that translates into improved health, longevity, et cetera, we haven't done anything. So we have to tell that story. I like, I like the format of this really that with the narratives, because I think that you know, the power of good story is really what's going to move us from here to the next step. I'm slightly more optimistic, to be honest. I actually, I, I came into this um, uh, from the private sector, really looking at at, um, at at this for the last 15 years, thinking that there was um, potentially reticence on the side of the government, uh, of, of people in the government, um, not to share this information. So I, I don't disagree with the concept of um, having that publicly available can be a challenge. but. Um, I, I actually think that there are a lot of progress is being made and that there are some things that I, I'm really, uh, I took four pages of notes and I'm, I'm really surprised at how many amazing initiatives are going on and um, really uh, applaud a lot of uh, the people in this room. Um, I also do think uh, that having uh, the Health Data Collaborative, frankly, is a game changer because um, being able to pull together public and private partnerships when, when I started working online 15 years ago, it, it was only kind of radical, crazy entrepreneurs that were out there working in this space and actually seeing it, you know, an organization like yours really develop and mature and, and bring these conversations together, I think is really fantastic. So a lot of my background is in um, industry change, business process transformation. And um, um, it turns out I've spent a fair amount of time in healthcare, but I, I'm, not, I'm not a healthcare guy, I'm a tech guy. That's, that's, that's the most of my life. Um, Todd Clark, from, uh, who was the HHS CTO and the US CTO, actually asked me to take this role. And one, and one thing they asked me is, why would you want me to do this? And he said, because you're on the outside, right? It's really hard to change from the inside. And I said, but I'm going to ask a lot of dumb questions. And he said, that's okay, right? Um, uh, in fact, some of those questions need to get asked. So I'm, I'm looking at it through that sort of lens. I've been looking for the little clues along the way to sort of tell me how hard is this? Or in fact, is it one of those things where the floodgates open? And I've been uh, extraordinarily um, um, encouraged by things like what HHS is doing. The examples we saw from San Diego to the Chicago Health Atlas but across the board, these really inspire me. And then every once in a while, I'll have a conversation that brings me back down to earth. So a few weeks ago, I had a, uh, I had a conversation with the chief medical officer of a major health system. And I said, you know, I think we need to have you talk about um, the role of health data in a major health system in a way that people can understand that, where you are, where you're going to go. He said, Dwayne, I, I, I couldn't agree more. The problem is this. I'm the chief medical officer. We really don't deal with data. We got other people to do that. And I was kind of floored by this notion that you don't deal in data, other people do that. How do you run a major you know, healthcare system? And so I began to understand 
that we actually have sort of this transformation in front of us where we've got a system that hasn't necessarily been driven by the data before. The management science isn't necessarily in place. Any thoughts on kind of, kind of how much of this is cultural transformation, how much of this is education, and how much of this really is make the data available and then sort of the system will adjust and get better as a result. My sense is that this is deeper. You've already mentioned this a little bit, but my sense is this is much deeper than the data. This is about people and policies and procedures. It's not even about the technology. Uh, you know, I think to just to go back to the first question that you made, I think what the new that uh, Chief Medical Officer was talking about is um, there are people whose job it is, is to treat the patients, and they're focusing really on clinical decision making. And then there's the whole business of running the enterprise. And a lot of the data conversations we're having are not really about what's the right diagnosis or treatment. Because in fact, that comes from the data being used by researchers that is then converted into a statement that is then applied. It really comes about from running the enterprise. And there's a lot of other people who are worried about running the enterprise. So it may be that there's a nuance there. It's not so much that they're not data driven. It's just that they're consuming it in a different way. I would say, though, that. Um, the uh, inability historically to be able to see the information has limited people's ability to, in, to use it in, in their own work. And so as we get better at that, I think it's going to be much more natural. I don't think that, uh, that clinical people are naturally data averse. Uh, I think it's really good that they just haven't had data that's had enough utility to really use it. I can tell you that we collect an awful lot of data. Um, and we probably use just a percentage of it. We uh, publish even a smaller percentage of that. Um, so I think that um, what what uh, part of the transformation is going to be is, uh, is educating consumers so the consumer is actually requesting certain types of information or at least certain types of apps or certain types of games. I mean, there's Wii games where you can play tennis and get your heart rate. There's other things. So it's about when, once you educate the consumer and there's this, uh, you know, this demand for stuff, I think then we can align ourselves in such a way that that uh, supplies what's needed for the demand, for the health outcome, or for the behavioral change. Right now, there are streams and streams, rules and rules of data that just sits around. Um, that, quite frankly, we collect by accident because we're getting other stuff um, and we don't use. And uh, we need to kind of repurpose our efforts um, so that we don't have a lot of diverted energy going towards collecting things that we don't need and really focused on. The story, for instance, in San Diego, they're looking at five disease complexes, whatever, they kind of drive 50% of the, of the deaths and mortality, what have you. Uh, and that, that's what I meant about strategic and purposeful. There's a huge universe of data. How much of it is, is really purposeful? How much of it is really going to move the lever in terms of increasing uh, the health of the population? Yeah, I, I'm not at all surprised by that conversation uh, with, with that executive. Um, I, I've been in some very recently where innovation is really uh, something they have to tick off the box, right? And they really are focused on running their organizations. And um, the concept of innovation is something you, out, you, you push down in the organization to someone who's in charge of that, and they deal with the data, right? But I do think that um, the, the concept of visually telling these stories, you know, whether it's within the organization to legislators, it is about it is about storytelling to, to exactly your concept for this entire um, day's conversation. It's about storytelling and being able to translate really complicated concepts um, and put them in the most simple terms. One of the things uh, that I found in at WebMD is most people don't even understand their own body. Right? If you try to point to where your liver is, I, I, this is an, an interesting audience, but if you actually line up people and ask them today, where's your gallbladder? Where's your liver? Right? Just very basic human organs. Most people don't have a real concept of their own body. And so I, I actually think that, that the steps that we're taking are really um, pretty monumental. They're, they're big steps, even though it feels like we're going at a glacial pace. Yeah. I'll just take what Lamar said and add to that um, and be real explicit. We, we have a signal to, we have a signal to noise ratio problem, and, and the discussions about data liberation just make the noise louder. And uh, I think what you're really hearing is a statement that um, somebody needs to get in between and convert that to signal. Because if, if you leave it to the end user, they're basically going to turn it off. That would be the only way they can manage it. So I want to double click on that with my next elephant on the table. And it plays off your point, Claire. 
Um, so I interviewed a mental health professional about a month ago. And I said, what do you think about this notion of making health records available and consolidating it in on demand of patients? He said, I'm for it spiritually. I get it. But we have no idea how to do that. He said, can you imagine what an average individual does when they basically you know, get neuropsych results back and they have to look at those? They have no context for processing that information. And it's probably the same in all different areas of medicine. Any sort of thoughts or reactions around sort of that aspect of this, which is you know, the real readiness of the system to take on data in, in sort of new and more open ways? Uh, well, I would look at the published information coming off the Open Records Project to get a sense of that. This is um, really where patients and doctors get contemporary or contemporaneous access to the doctor's record, no filter, not the patient view. And what's interesting is, first of all, uh, in the studies that have been published, the doctors, many doctors who hadn't done it were really afraid that it was going to be a big distraction to their practice. For exactly the same reason you described. It could confuse the patient coming in, consuming a bunch of my time, asking questions which they wouldn't have asked otherwise. And after they were implemented, what they realized, the doctors, um, their, complete, their point of view changed completely. Because for the most part, patients, you know, we, in some ways, the concept that patients can't deal with this information is a, something of an anathema because patients have access to their own information all the time and they sort it out. Um, it's really more challenging for the doctors to make sense of the information as opposed to blocking. But I do think that the open records literature would suggest that that problem goes away once people have experience with it. But you have to have experience with it first. Yeah, it's, it's something you said about the danger of having a little bit of information. Um, because I've had a lot of patients in my practice days that would read a little something on the web and then they come in and that can really distract and take up a lot of time because they don't have the, uh, you know, the background to really interpret it. So I think that as we're uh, making this transition, we're going to have to talk in pictures. We're going to have to do a lot of benchmarking so they can see where they line up compared to the norm, to the average, to the other woman in their age group, those type of things. So I think we need to be really careful about not dumbing down the information, but putting it in a uh, digestible way where consumers, especially those who've been disenfranchised, uh, you know, minority populations, those um, uh, with, uh, with, that speak other languages, so they can really kind of get it and then use that information to empower themselves and, and to improve health of their families. And, and to be advocates for their own health, right? Once, they, once you understand something, you can actually uh, ask questions and take action. And, and I, do, I do think um, I, I hate to use the term dumbing down, right? But I do think that there's really some basic opportunities to educate um, that we're really missing. And, and I do think, I happen to personally think a lot of them are visual. It is being able to, to um, orient someone, um, not goes quite so far probably as adding a game layer to everything in the, in the universe. Um, but I do think that um, uh, really being able to create common language, um, cultural, common language, um, uh, and, and communicate that way is really the big opportunity for um, government organizations and the private sector. Excellent. Two more questions, and then we'll be done with the lightning round. Uh, the first one is this. What do you think, what do you think is the most important thing the, the Health Data Consortium, or we as a whole, can be focused on over the next year or two to really put Health Data to work? Is it education? Is it the technology? Is it convening the parties? What's the most important thing we can do to help this transformation along? I think it's convening the parties. I think that is the most important thing because the, the dude in the skinny pants uh, <laughs> is the guy who's going to change things. I, I am working with entrepreneurs every single day and, and getting perspectives from, from these um, you know, young and old, actually, which is what is also really interesting. That the, the entrepreneurial world isn't just the world of you know the 23 year old. Um, I, I'm seeing people shifting careers. I'm seeing people exiting you know um, very well well developed careers and moving into um, into this uh, space. So I think keep having the parties that these amazing people are showing up, and I think you're connecting dots in in a way that ha hasn't been done before. I, I would agree. But I think also simultaneously, we can't do this sequentially because the technology is moving too fast and the need is it's too, uh, it's too drastic and too urgent. Um, but I think in addition to, to that, um, we have to, as government organizations, from the federal, state, down to local, we have to streamline the data we collect and the way we, we package it. Um, and again, getting back to all the unnecessary data that, that we collect, um, which really just diverts a lot of 
uh, energy in that room. So. I agree. I think the, the conversation and the convening is necessary for alignment. But I also think that um, we have to uh, be explicit about what the public policy restrictors are. And rather than not talk about them and hope that everything else will make it go away, confront those issues directly and figure out what it takes to get past that. Because in many ways, it's I believe that in some cases there's actually a lack of honesty about what people's motivations are that is actually causing these mistrust to exist. So exposing that conversation will have value. Okay, so for the last question, you're all Alvin Toffler. I don't know if you remember Alvin Toffler, but uh, you're all going to be futurists. So looking out three to five years, let's say we accomplished some of the big things we want to accomplish. How have we impacted the healthcare system? What's your prediction for three to five years out? Um, not necessarily focused on the ACA, but focused on really putting the health data to work and driving some of the things we talked about today. What could we achieve? I think God. Uh, we will uh, begin to shift the center of gravity uh, away from the delivery system and to the patients, where actually the patients are the ones who determine how things work, rather than the delivery system determining. And, and the, the technology plus the other trends is going to make that happen. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I would say patient-centeredness and also um, just the ability to get your health information at your fingertips and understand it, to embrace that information, and to make choices based on that. So I think that, by in and of itself, will begin to change health behaviors and, and, and eventually health outcomes. Yeah, I completely uh, concur on, on the uh, patient side. I also um, really see a world where physicians are less encumbered by a lot of the bureaucratic work that they need to do. And every physician that I know um, wanted to become a doctor because they wanted to be able to treat people and be part of a solution. And I think actually freeing physicians to do the work that, that uh, they're passionate about is, is what we're going to see by the technology and data evolution as well. I love the vision. Thank you very much. So this is a lightning round. You are all electric. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Because we've seen in every industry, once the patient, or I should say the consumer, the patient in this case, I also think, by the way, the consumer is the doctor, the patient and the doctor. Once they start to get some of that center of gravity, once they start to gain more and more control, you can't put that back in the bottom. And in every one of those cases, it's technology that enabled that. So I'm optimistic. We have a tremendous amount to do, but I'm optimistic. Um, I want to say thank you to an awful lot of people today, uh, but I'll try to keep it brief. First, I want to thank all of our speakers, the panelists, those that presented. There was a tremendous amount of passion in this. You can tell people are here for a whole day. Some flew in from across the country because they care about this topic. It's important. It matters. And that came through today. So I want to thank each and every one of you. I want to thank sponsors, including the California Healthcare Foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Esri, I want to again thank 1871 for its use of this phenomenal facility. And quite frankly, for all of the help and support in actually making today happen. Uh, as you saw people running around today, I can't tell you how much uh, uh, engagement and involvement there's been in the weeks and months leading up to this. So it really does take a village even to put on a meeting like this. Um, I want to thank all of the volunteers that helped. Um, so thank, thanks to all of you. You can see some of them in their 1871 t-shirts. Uh, but again, it takes a tremendous amount. I want to thank um, Sarah Zellner. So many of you, particularly the speakers and the panelists, know Sarah's name. But Sarah's sitting right there. Uh, big, big <laughs> uh, it's really, uh, this would not have been possible. It would not have been possible um, without her. So thank you, Sarah. I want to thank again Illinois and the Illinois Department of Public Health. I want to thank, um, again, Stephen. So Stephen, again, we, you were part of the inspiration for the meeting. Uh, we teamed on this, and I'm just so pleased that it worked out the way it did. So thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, we have lots of invitations. So first, I want to invite you uh, to participate in the event tomorrow. As you saw in all of the documents, there's actually the 8th and the 9th. And when Stephanie and I first started talking about the event, we said, wouldn't it be cool to have something focused on the state and local government around open health data, and Stephen said, wouldn't it be cool to have a hackathon and a datathon and to do all of that? And that's really what sort of put these together. So I'd like to invite Stephen for a moment to kind of talk about tomorrow in the hope that uh, some of you will actually be able to stay over and join the crew that will be here in this very same room. Time tomorrow. Sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. All right, so this is just a real quick commercial for tomorrow. Um, you know, many of you spent long hours.